My name's Dave. I'm Tim. Welcome to our first video, Varmint Safari. Tim and I have been hunting and fishing together for about 20 years now. About a year ago, we were talking about the fact that there aren't any videos we know of that show all the different types of varmint hunting we like to do. So we decided to make our own. A year and a lot of work later, here we are. We'll be taking you with us on 13 hunts in four states that we've been on in the last year while making this video. We'll be going after coyotes, rock chucks, prairie dogs, and even jackrabbits. Along the way, we'll try and share some tips with you on how to find your own places to hunt and show you some of the rifles and the gear that we use. We hope you'll enjoy watching the show. We sure enjoyed making it. Now let's take off on our first hunt. We're joined by our friend Mike for some rock chuck shooting action in Idaho last July. <laughs> okay, He's out left. right where he first was, Mike. Big as life. Thump a rooski. I think I got me one. Adios, Chuckster. Nicely done. One. Fire at will, Tim. Okay. Lost the guys on this walker. He's there. Yeah, I'm watching the walker. I got one just lifted the flag to pit. That's the one Tim just shot over. Hi. Hi. Ooh, right in the butt. That man slow. I couldn't tell. Is he he's still off. Yeah, him? he's still running around. You take him, Dave. Either one of you. I'm filming him nicely. He's going right above that lone. That lone. Okay, he's out, out the right side of the Russian olive, Mike. The lone one. Okay, I see. Him. He's showing up good. Is he still offering a shot? Yeah. Where at? He's trucking. How far right or left? He, that got him. That got him. Sure enough! <laughs> God, I held about three inches low and missed him low. Just Tim, dusted him off. Tim, give him a nice tail wag. That was some air time. That was... <laughs> Airborne. Oh my. Still pretty. I blew apart the rock. Good night, Grace. That looked like the end of story. Dead. Nicely. That was a big one. Get the end. Look at the tail. Get on him. 
Shooting those rock chucks was a whole lot of fun. That last hunt you just watched took place in July. The temperature's getting a little hot for shooting them in July. We usually get our best shooting in from May until June. Now this next hunt you're going to see, we're going to be going after prairie dogs. We have my little nephew Steven with us. He's never shot prairie dogs before. And you'll see him make a 490 yard one shot kill. It's really neat. Audio. This is what our usual summertime varmint camp looks like. We usually leave on a Friday night after work and just pitch camp late at night and we get wherever we're going, sleep under the stars. I like to use my cot that you can see there. Tim usually sleeps on a pad in the back of the truck. We've got his nephew Stephen with us on this trip, so that's both of them. You can see crashed out right there. I'm going to wake him up. All balled up with his back to us. Laser range, 279 yards. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Smaller ones. Little guy. Little teeny guy. Uh, a lot of little teeny guys now. <laughs> okay, let's give somebody else a turn. Are you looking? Right down near that toe we were talking about. Sitting there? Yeah, that biggest, biggest mound right on the end, right in it. Fat and sassy. Oh, okay. He's dead meat. Tim shooting his 243, 280 yard dog. Adios. Shabby for the little 40 grain bullet out of the 22 BR. Let's see if we can get a laser range on him. That was 457 yards. Maybe he disappeared in a cloud. Yeah, he's flipping around, Tim. You got him. Definitely. He's doing the death squiggle. Good shot. Let me laser range that one real quick. That was further than the last one I took.
Well, this little Savage 22BR is really performing for us this morning. We just sat down, three shooters, uh, eight shots between us, three dead prairie dogs between uh, 457 and uh, 485 yards. This is uh, the cheap plastic Savage factory stock. This is a Cabela's scope, four and a half by 14 scope. I do have the, the Sharpshooter Supply custom barrel on here though. This is one of Fred Moreo's Sharpshooter Supply barrels, aftermarket barrels in 22 BR. And we're shooting 40 grain VMAX at about 4,000 feet per second with N135. And boy, it's the combo this morning. It just lighten these long-range prairie dogs up on a budget. Breeze picked up. I think might have snuck in and got me there. Okay, he's up on top of his mound looking good. <laughs> got him clean. All right. Give him just a little windage for that breeze that picked up. That's four prairie dogs in ten shots at uh, 457 to that one, I believe, was actually getting up around 490. Well, there's a few of them out there. But they're they're getting skittish. Let's leave these guys for seed. Move on to the next spot. This little guy out in the grass here, he's not too far for the old savage. That smacked him. favorite types of varmint hunting is jump shooting jackrabbits. It's where we grab a rifle, pocket full of ammo, we walk around in the sagebrush kicking up jackrabbits. We think it's just some of the most fun you can have with a rifle. In this next short segment, we're going to give you just a taste of what jump shooting jacks is all about. Then we're going to go out to Nevada for a coyote stand. And then we'll go to southeastern Utah for a visit in my bow hunting camp. There he goes, Dave. Right down below me, sitting. Yeah, baby! Walk on down there and pick him up for us. Right there, somewhere. That got him.
come in just, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds after I blew that series and turned off the camera. But he came crosswind and got my wind and I took a prayer shot. Son of a gun. Well, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Pays to uh, have a predator to call with you all the time. You never know when the, the opportunity is going to come up to, to call a predator, whether you are in a position to even shoot or not. It's fun just calling them in. I'm up here, mountains of southeast Utah, on my annual archery mule deer hunt. I blew a stock on a buck this morning and was in an area that. I know traditionally holds coyotes, so I decided to go ahead and try calling one after I uh, spooked out that big old buck. And made one series of fawn distress on the critter call, and one series of pup in distress, and this old boy, he come a-trotting right up the fence line, and I put an arrow through him at 15 yards. Hit him a little far back. But uh, he didn't go very far. About 200 yards, found him dead. Good fun, good, good fun. Let's take a few minutes and show you some of the rifles we use on our hunts. This first one I'd like to show you is a custom. I had built several years ago by a very talented riflesmith in Texas named Mike Bryant. It's built on a Nasika Bay action with a jewel trigger set at four ounces. The stock is a Hunter Benchrest style stock. You notice it's got a, a wide flat forend that is designed to be very stable shooting off of a rest. The scope is a Night Force 8x32 variable. And I can't say enough good things about this scope. The optical quality and the mechanical liability of this scope, it's just awesome. The barrel that's been on this rifle through the making of most of this video is this one. This is a Lilja, 29 inches long, and it's chambered for 22-250 Ackley Improved. It's a fast twist barrel set up especially for shooting VLD bullets. Now the advantage to VLD bullets, at least the way that we use them, is that they aren't affected by the wind nearly as much as traditional style varmint bullets. I've been having real good luck with Starkey 80 grain bullets. They have a BC of 480. Making first shot hits in the wind with a setup like this is so much easier than it is with traditional 40 or 50 grain bullets, it isn't even funny. This other barrel that's on the rifle right now is chambered for 22 br and that's my favorite all-around varmint cartridge. It's just superbly accurate. Uh, velocity is very near the 22 250 but it uses a lot less powder so there's not as much blast, not as much recoil. The barrel doesn't heat up as fast, it's going to last longer. For high volume, pinpoint accuracy shooting, 22 BR is hard to beat. Now you notice that this barrel has a muzzle brake on it. Between the heavy weight of this rifle and the muzzle brake with the Ackley, the 22 BR doesn't need one, I can see my own hits through this scope even at 32 power. That's pretty neat. Really neat in fact. Now I like the 22 BR so much, I've got another one. This is my Savage. This one started life as a 22 250. I put this barrel on myself. For you guys that like to tinker with your own rifles, these Savages are a really neat way to go. Um, Sharpshooter Supply in Ohio sells these barrels fully chambered, threaded, ready to go. All you've got to do is just put them on. It just takes a few simple tools. It's really easy, neat way to go. Um, the trigger is probably the weakest point on a Savage. This is also a sharpshooter supply trigger that I installed myself. Again, very easy to do. 
ever since I set this up as a 22 BR, it's become my most used rifle. You'll see me and Tim both using this rifle a lot in this video. We do use it a lot, all the time. The scope is a Cabela's brand, 4.5 by 14. It was very inexpensive scope, and I've been real pleased with it, especially for the price. All in all, this Savage was a very easy and inexpensive way to get set up in a semi-custom rifle that is just a lot of fun to shoot. It's really accurate. I, I can't say enough good things about it. This last one I want to show you, this is an old favorite. This is Tim's. This is Tim's Model 70, 243. He's had it about as long as I've known him. I've seen him make more great shots with this rifle than I could even begin to count. Uh, there's nothing fancy about this rifle. This rig proves that you don't need to spend a lot of money to go out and have a lot of fun varmint hunting. This is all original factory parts. I did give it the tune-up that I give all of our rifles. I floated the barrel, bedded the action, gave it a trigger job, lapped the rings, etc. But there's nothing fancy about this rifle and it gets the job done. The scope is just an old Redfield 3x9. Nothing fancy there. A lot of guys think that a 3x9 scope isn't enough for shooting prairie dogs. But Tim's proven time and again that it works just great. This rifle works good for jump shooting jackrabbits. Works good on a coyote stand. Tim's even lent it out to guys that's killed a lot of deer. It's one rifle that can do it all and has. Now on this next hunt, we're going to Wyoming for prairie dogs in August. We've got Tim's brother Todd and our old friend John with us. And I want you to pay attention and look at some of the 350 yard shots Tim's just knocking down with this old sporter weight 243 with the 3x9 scope. Take a look at this table that we use here. This is just a plywood top. Some of these banquet table legs that you can get at your hardware store. I blocked them up a little bit because I wanted to I wanted my bench a little bit taller, but a little bit of angle iron helped make it more rigid. As you can see, that thing just sets up, it's light, it's quick, it's easy. It's, it's pretty stable. I shot some good groups off of it. And I like a, a bench rest style front rest. Gives a good stable platform with the rear bag. Now, for this dog shooting, I like a rear bag that's real squeezable. I also like the tall ears. It, uh, it gives you a lot more range of aim. You know, you can squeeze those ears and really raise your butt up. And this bag's just real easy to work a lot of angles from, which is useful. You're changing your aim point constantly out prairie dog. By shooting groups at the range, I like a, a more dense bag with shorter ears. Uh, this is not the bag I use for group shooting, but I really like it for prairie dog. That's our that's our setup right there.
southwest Wyoming this morning on some public land that we've never shot before. We just pulled up. Got a few dogs in the grass out here, about 300 yards. Little BR. See that one standing up, Tim? Mm hmm. Ready? Absolutely. He popped good. That one, a little bit closer. Not over 300, I don't think. Not much. He's looking good. Say good night. He flew. Tossed that one. One more still there. Oh, running. Stopped. Never to run again. Tim's sitting down with his 243 and some new 55 grain Blitz Kings that we loaded up the other night. Got some dogs out there at about 375 yards. Him. Nice shot. You didn't hear it? I heard it. I didn't I had my binoculars on the wrong dog. You try for that other one? Yeah. Why not? Nice Nicely shot. done. Nice shot. Here we go. Got that guy balled up out in the grass out there. Oh, good shot. There's me and John walking out to inspect our kills, taking our rim fires with us. We usually get in some pretty good shooting, just walking around the dog town with the rim fires like that. Now, I don't know if we were blind, or it's just because we weren't as high as the camera and we couldn't actually see them, but look at all those prairie dogs that we're not seeing. There's some more straight ahead. That's about 300 yards from the camera right there, just for reference.
Chef Boy RD. Holy smokes, did you scatter that guy? Okay, now this next hunt something a little bit different. This is our annual mule deer hunt in the high Wasatch Mountains of Utah, a little place we like to call the hell hole. Now on this hunt, we've got our good friend John, my brother Todd, and his son Stephen along. This is Stephen's first mule deer hunt, so Todd's not packing a rifle this year. He just wants to concentrate on helping Stephen secure his first deer. Now, Dave's not packing a gun this year because he does most of his deer hunting with bow and arrow. As usual, when we go up into the hell hole, we have a real good time. There's Tim and John easing down into what we call the hell hole before light. It's opening morning of Utah deer season here. We've had about a two hour hike in the dark to get up in here. Doesn't hurt to be about half billy goat to hunt this spot. It's really some steep, rough stuff. Oop. Packing a buck out of here is not a thrill, I'll tell you that. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning, and Stephen just took a shot from up behind us here. He got a buck. There's Todd and Steven right there going over to collect Steven's deer. Steven's struggling to display his 3x3 three three for us, his first buck. Pretty decent little shot he made on it too. Yeah. Where'd you hit him? Good job, guys. Now the fun begins. Here, you want to come help? <laughs> okay. well, about an hour later, after Stephen shot his, this guy showed up up the mountain behind us. Neither Tim or Joan wanted to shoot him. They were both hoping for something bigger to show up later. I didn't have a tag or a rifle, but if I had, I'd have killed this buck just because he's so close to the top and would have been so much easier to pack out than most of the deer we usually get out of this spot. But nobody nobody took him. We just let him go. This little guy showed up a little while after that. Uh, way down in deep and too small to boot. Definitely not the kind you want to shoot in this spot. And along about 11 o'clock, I spotted this group, which included a decent buck. Yeah. Okay. I look right at the bottom of the rocks. He's blending right into the pine. Right at the bottom. This way. There's Johnny walking down to get his buck.
just low. Low right. Yeah, he's still there, Dan. In the brush. There he is. Coming out, right, right out them the other side of them quakes from where you shot, going into them green quakes. Oh, you hit him! You hit him! You, yeah, he's rolling! He's rolling! Good shot, Tim. take a look at some of the optics we use on our hunts. One of the items you'll see on our bench nearly everywhere we go is this laser rangefinder. It's really hard to judge distance out on the open prairie. And once the distances start to get much over about 300 yards, knowing the exact distance really makes it a lot easier to score hits. This particular unit is a Leica LRF 1200. Tim and I have been using these small, affordable laser rangefinders for about five years now. We've had several different brands and models. For our money, right now, this is the unit to have. Uh, actually, throughout most of the video, the unit you see is my old 800-yard unit. I just got this 1200 one recently and really like it a lot. A um, couple things to keep in mind about using these rangefinders. None of these under $500 rangefinders are going to let you take a reading directly off of something as small as a prairie dog or a rock chuck out there 400 yards. You're going to have to take your reading off of something larger. Prairie dog mounds are great for taking laser range findings off of. Uh, the rock piles that we usually find rock chucks in work great for taking readings off of. Another thing to keep in mind about using these is that it helps a lot to hold them steady. The smaller the target you're trying to range, or the farther away it is, the more important it becomes to hold the unit steady. If you're trying to range something small that's a long ways away, you probably won't be able to get a reading unless you can really hold the unit steady. It helps to find something to lean it against. Uh, something we never go hunting without is our binoculars especially if we're after prairie dogs or rock chucks we spend a whole lot of time like this with a pair of binoculars growing out of our forehead now I'm not going to go into trying to tell you what kind of binoculars you should use that really comes down to personal preference for myself for sitting around glassing for chucks prairie dogs something like that I like a fairly big powerful glass like these 10 by 50s uh, to carry around my neck hiking, any kind of carrying, I like a more compact binocular, something like an 8x32. Now the only thing I can really tell you about buying binoculars is spend just as much as you can. You really do get what you pay for when it comes to glass. And when you're looking through them for hours a day, a pair of cheap binoculars is just going to give you one monster of a headache. And you're not going to want to look through them all day long and if you're not looking through them you're not seeing the varmints you're not getting the shots uh, I've been out with guys before that didn't bring binoculars at all and those guys may well have been legally blind a lot of the varmints we shoot a lot of the varmints you see getting killed on this video we can't see them with our naked eye they're too far away they're too small they blend in too well we just can't see them at all without our binoculars uh, this old a pair of Redfields here served me really well for quite a while, and I can't complain about them. But if we make any money selling this video, the first thing I'm going to buy is a pair of really good binoculars. One of the questions that Tim and I get asked the most often is exactly where do we go to hunt? 
Now, obviously, we can't tell you exactly where our hunting spots are, but we'd be glad to tell you how we found those hunting spots. The first key to finding your own really good varmint hunting is to realize that you do have to get out there and look. There's so many people that just want to be told exactly where to go and they aren't willing to go out there and look for themselves. And let's face it, nobody's going to tell you exactly where their honey hole's at. For me and Tim, half the adventure is just getting out there and seeing what we can find. About half the hunts you see on this video, it's the first time we'd ever been to those places and they're all on public land. If you'll take a little time, a little gas money to get away from the pavement and look, you're going to find more good varmint hunting than you know what to do with. We use some uh, GPS and some mapping tools that are really neat, help us in our explorations, and we'll show you a little bit more about those later on. But let's talk about finding rock chucks to shoot. As the name rock chuck would imply, we find most of them in or around rock piles. We've seen them in rock piles out in the sagebrush in the desert, uh, all the way up into the high mountain meadows. But the best place to find high numbers of rock chucks is where rock piles meet irrigated fields. Where you see us shooting in Idaho on this video, we've got old lava flows coming down to meet alfalfa fields. That's prime rock chuck habitat. But you can find chucks where there isn't any farming going on just about any outcropping or rock pile in any of the western states could be home to a colony of rock chucks. Tim and I have gotten in the habit of whenever we come across a, a rock pile or a rock outcropping we stop and we glass it with our binoculars. You might be really surprised at how often and in how many different places we find new places to shoot rock chucks that way. If you'll get in that habit too you'll find rock chucks, I guarantee you, they're out there. Speaking of rock chucks, this next hunt, we're with Mike, our friend Mike in Idaho again, where that lava and that alfalfa meet. Yeah. Hey. Oh. Nope. There's Tim and Mike, looking like they usually look when we're chuck hunting. Got binoculars growing out of their forehead, glassing for chucks. In there. <laughs> I just held dead on his back and on his butt. Yeah, I saw him lying. That was a flipper. Probably about 275, 300. You got your Ranger? Yeah, 304. That'll work. See these, that tree, these two trees here and then the other tree to okay. the right of it? There's one with a nest in it. Yeah, come to the left of it, over all that crap on a rock. Is he kind of sitting up on an angle like this? Yeah. Yeah, he's leaning with his head up and his body and his butt down. Okay, he's going to get launched. 300 yards. Maybe give him a little bit of wind. Oh, yeah. Toss. He wanted, no, oh, he's just laying there to the left. Toss him dead left. Nice shot. One for one. <laughs> Looks like the top pile, Dave, where I took the one off. Over here. 
Hi. No, you got him. Yeah, he rolled off. He rolled off. I got it. Left of the cement pile, up high in front right, of a I'm rock. On him. He's running like. Yeah. Look at him flatten out. And left. No, I've lost him again, though, but. He's way left. Rocked him. I got to see him. I, I put the binoculars on him. Oh boy. Nice launch. Another one running up there. Oh yeah. Ooh, beauty. Go ahead, at will. That made him scamper. Is that one still sitting there? Just a second, I gotta reload. Pretty sure I blew the one off the side. Yeah, that's another one, that's the other one. Okay, I'm gonna shoot. Take him. Got him right in the head. Go take a look at this with my scope. He blew his head right off. Here goes the tail. Oh, that was hilarious. See ya. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Something we found very useful in our trips looking for new places to hunt is a GPS. This model I have now is a Garmin E-Trex Legend model. It's got 8 megabyte of memory built into it so that I can upload uh, detailed maps into it off the Garmin CDs. Uh, Tim and I make a habit out of getting as far away from pavement and out in the middle of nowhere as we can. And we found the detail of these maps to be really quite good. The, Jeep trails and faint two tracks really show up well. Another tool that goes hand in hand with the GPS is a good mapping program for your PC. There are a lot of packages out there. I like the one from MapTech. It comes with all of the topo maps, USGS topo maps for two entire states on CD. And the GPS and the mapping program talk to each other. So you can go through and look at your topo maps and mark all the spots you want to go or the roads or whatever and put them right on the GPS. It's really neat. Um, I've always been a big topo map user and I've got a huge collection of paper maps at home. But having them on the PC like this is just the way to go. Much easier, makes it a lot easier to use. With this particular setup, I can even hook the GPS up to the laptop in the truck and it'll plot our position in real time on a regular USGS topo map. It's really neat. Uh, these tools have really helped us a lot in our explorations of finding new places to hunt. Let's talk about finding places to shoot prairie dogs on public land. I really think prairie dogs are the easiest varmints to find. I mean, a prairie dog town, even a small one, sticks out like a sore thumb. Tim and I have found lots of really good shooting by literally spotting prairie dogs as we're driving by at 65 miles an hour on the interstate. Um, if you do your homework and you know that a general area holds prairie dogs, finding them really is as easy as taking a Sunday drive in the area. Just go out and drive around, you'll find them. Uh, the prairie dogs you see us hunting in this video are all whitetail prairie dogs. Now they're pretty similar to the blacktail variety that most of you are probably more familiar with, but there are a few differences. Uh, the whitetail prairie dog is generally smaller, body size is smaller, and they definitely live in smaller groups, smaller towns. You don't see whitetail prairie dog towns anywhere near the size of the big blacktail dog towns further east. Because of the nature of these smaller dog towns, we tend to not shoot the same area twice in one year. Uh, we like to give them a rest. By the same token, 
we'll never shoot all of the dogs that we see. We'll roll up on a spot, we'll shoot a few, and we'll leave the rest for seed. You really can't just sit and shoot from one spot all day like you can in a big blacktail prairie dog town. And this next hunt, we're going to join up with my old buddy Frank in south central Wyoming in a place we'd never been before and we're looking for prairie dogs. As you're about to see, we found them. Here's varmint camp again, coffee going, Tim's still crashed out of course. Listen to these coyotes out. I love waking up on the prairie. Oh, that got him. Oh, I heard the noise. Yeah. Spolat. That knocked him out. Right. The other one's improving his diggings. Wow! Holy shit! <laughs> Did you get that? Yeah. He flew. I launched him. Nice toss. That blows in the grass on him. Wow, spectacular. <laughs> 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 Just right of the one I shot on all fours. Did you see that?
tight. This one's playing army. Not anymore, he ain't. Gotta give him a little more left windage than you think. Nice shot. Giving him about half a dog into the wind. That's some more like it. Oh, what a fatty. That one over right in the mound? Yeah. Okay, that's the one that's getting launched. You see her, Tim? Yeah. Whoop. Uh-uh. There's one, I think, on the mound to the right. Yeah, there is. Where'd he go? Okay, I see him. Ready? Good fun. This is another one of the rifles you see us using quite a bit in this video. It's my Remington 788 and 22 250. And this is just a very plain Jane, no frills factory rifle. All of its original factory parts, very inexpensive rifle. The scope that was on it is the Cabela's 4.5 by 14 that you saw on my Savage earlier. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better shooting rifle for the money than these old 788s. This particular rifle is the most accurate sporter I've ever owned. It's just hell on wheels for jump shooting jackrabbits or shooting called coyotes, as you'll see later on in this video. Now this one, this is my little Model 7, 223. This is my go-everywhere rifle. I take this one with me more places than any other rifle. Uh, if I need something light and handy, this is what I reach for. On a quick trip where I'm only going to take one, this is usually the one I reach for. Uh, it's got a Leopold 45 by 14 scope on it. I've used this rifle for every kind of vermin hunting I do, from shooting prairie dogs to coyotes, and it's served me well for everything. I think everybody ought to have one of these little Model 7s in 223. Just a great little rifle. On this next hunt, me and Tim are going to southern Utah for a coyote hunt. Got the, the topos right here on the computer. Computer talks to the GPS. We mark all of our, you can really browse the terrain really neat on the computer. Go to the, the 
the really quad sheets. As you can see, you can see drainages. You can tell how far your walk is. You can tell where the cover's at. You can really tell a lot about a place you've never been. And like I say, I've gone through and picked all the likely looking spots. I've got it all marked. And so we won't be going blind in the morning. We've never been here before, but we've got a pretty good idea of what the country looks like. We know exactly where we're going to make our first six stands or so tomorrow. So. This is just a real pretty little stand we got set up here. I'm using the Thumper Open Read Call and the Fox Pro at the same time. But uh, as pretty as it looked, and as good as it sounded, didn't produce. So it's time to move on. Started this stand off with a couple howls from the Fox Pro and switched to the Woodpecker in distress. And we got a coyote that came up right up in front of our face there that I didn't get the camera on and Tim didn't get a shot at either. And then Tim spotted another one further down the draw here. And I thought I couldn't get the camera on her, but uh, she's actually right in the middle of the screen just standing behind a bush there. I like to go to this pup distress sound either on the electronic or mouth call after we take a shot. A lot of times it'll get another coyote that's nearby to show itself, especially where we've already seen one on a stand like this. I'll always go to the coyote. Didn't work this time though. Nicely done. Nicely. Started out this stand with a howl on the Fox Pro like I often do. And we got an answer right away. A howl back. So I switched to the Woodpecker Distress using the remote control. And she came in right away. She came running up out of the draw. And I was ready to shoot her right away, but Tim didn't have the camera quite ready. And I got too excited waiting and missed that first shot. But actually worked out pretty good for us. That second shot made some pretty good footage. Mm. Mm. 
Why don't you go gather that old coyote up, Tim? Used the same combination again on this stand using the Fox Pro. Started out with the howls and after a couple minutes switched to the Woodpecker Distress. This big furred up male showed up about four minutes in. Boy, is he furred up nice. This one made a real nice fur. saw driving in here. Dave hopped out and give him a thumper. We're out in Nevada. The next weekend after that southern Utah hunt, as Tim just mentioned, spotted this coyote, jumped out and shot her. Left her at the nearest tree going to get the truck, skinning equipment. Now watch. Watch that area in that circle. See that? And then again, goes by right there. Another coyote running by, we never saw until we were watching this film later on. We do skin and make use of the fur on most of the coyotes that we shoot. The method to see us use in there is one I learned from watching a video from Findlay Furs and uh, we'll put up the information on how you can get a copy of that video at the end of our show. I highly recommend it. It really does take the pain out of getting the skin off of a coyote. One of the pieces of gear I've gotten in the habit of carrying with me on coyote stands are these shooting sticks. I've used bipods, but I really prefer the shooting sticks. They're a lot more versatile for adjusting height or handling uneven terrain, and they're not attached to the rifle, which I really do prefer. They hold the rifle in the ready position, hands free, and really do help steady the rifle for the long shot when it's needed. Handy piece of gear. Now, we use a lot of different calls in our coyote hunt. We use both the hand calls and the electronic. I feel that the electronic gives you some pretty solid advantages over the hand calls. The biggest advantage is that you can place the electronic caller 50, 60 yards away from your position and when the coyote responds and comes in he's focused on that spot not where you're at and that's a good thing. Sometimes what I actually do quite often is use both the hand calls and the electronic on the same stand. I'll set the electronic out there 50, 60 yards away on really low volume and just leave it running really low. And then I'll call like I normally do with a hand call. When the coyote responds, comes into the stand, that electronic sitting out there 50, 60 yards away on really low volume 
acts like a, a decoy or a distractor. The coyote focuses in on it every time and focuses away from us. That lets us get away with some movement or some mistakes here and there that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get away with, I think. When we go scouting for coyotes, we're looking for several things. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about coyotes is that they are territorial. And it's not uncommon for a man-made dirt road to be a territorial boundary. Not only that, but coyotes are just like you and me. They'll take the easiest walking, and often as not, that's going to be a dirt road. What all this means is, is that if there's coyotes in an area, there's a real good chance they're going to be traveling along the roads, using the roads, leaving tracks and scat. If the road is one of those territorial boundaries I just mentioned, they'll leave especially a lot of scat. So when we're driving around looking for coyotes, we're paying attention, looking right in the road for sign, for tracks and scat. And a lot of times we won't stop and call until we see tracks or scat. Another thing you can do to find coyotes, it's really easy and sure fires to listen for them howling. Early in the morning, late at night, they will howl if they're around and you'll hear them. You can even do some howling of your own to elicit a response from them, locate them, make sure they're in the area. Great way to know whether there's coyotes in an area or not. This next hunt started out as a coyote hunt, but after a couple of early morning stands and we hadn't seen a single coyote track in the fresh snow or heard a coyote howl, but we were seeing a lot of jackrabbits running around. Me and Tim switched gears and turned it into a jackrabbit hunt. Up there, Dave. Sitting pretty, sitting pretty. Another one. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Nice shot. You're out of the picture. Took him out of the gym. Nice shooting, Tim. It's a pretty big jack there, Tim.
coming over that side. I'll be coming out right there. He's stopping. Nice shot. brain shot. Yeah. You know, that you got him. Good shot again. Most excellent shot. 788's on fire today. You get that? Definitely. Oh yeah. I've done a right good job on him. Holy smokes, yeah. type of hunt you just watched was one of me and Dave's favorite. That's jump shooting jackrabbits. Now those jackrabbits, they're not too hard to find. We just get out after a fresh snowstorm, drive around and look for tracks. You know, that's one of our very most favorite hunts. We've been doing it since we was little kids. Now we're gonna head back to Wyoming, shoot some more prairie dogs. As much as we enjoy sleeping under the stars, we do sometimes go with the tent. When we got in the night before, past midnight, it was raining, the wind was howling, it was cold. We wimped out, went with the tent on this trip.
right there. That one was juicy. Fifty-eight grain V Max really doing them well today. I'll say. Gotta love them Hornadies. That was one of the best launches I have ever seen. Senior Peg. Are you ready to die, Senior Peg? Absolutely. Now, I'm going to put it back over here and you should be on one, Tim. Unless you truck. Toss. You're right about the launch. He launched. 
243 sends them into orbit. Pretty common to see a lot of antelope around at prairie dog towns, especially in Wyoming. I was playing a fawn distress and coyote sound on my Fox Pro, and these two antelope buck here really wanted to come see what was going on. They can see us, and they've already been downwind of us, and they still are trying to get closer to that collar. They're just really bugged by that sound. Even this old broomtail wanted to come see what was going on. Nice. The other one above him. Tagging up nice. Setting up nice. Turn, Tim. Jacking them up. Ready. Okay, on this next hunt, Dave and his good friend Dave go rock chuck shooting on a private ranch in Wyoming. As you'll see, Dave's friend Dave does all the shooting and Dave just runs the camera.
You got him. Here's another one. I'm going to walk to the right closer. See that? Tumbled him as well. What's that? Tumbled him. <laughs> nice shot. It wasn't very spectacular. It'll work. Oh yeah. See now you've you've seen the squeaker in action. Indeed. In that last scene, right at the end, my friend Dave mentioned a squeaker. Let me show you what he was talking about. This is something that Dave showed me that Tim and I have been using and it really works. It's just a little squirrel call. Makes a little squirrel bark when you hit the bellows. And what Dave showed me and what I found to be true is that a lot of time you can get a chuck to poke his head up and take a look around to see who's making the racket so you can get a shot at him. If you see a chuck and he dives down his hole or you just suspect there's a chuck in a rock pile that you can't see, hit the squeaker and a lot of times it'll bring that chuck up and give you a shot. Tim and I have even tried it on prairie dogs and it worked to bring them up out of their holes too. Not every time, but often enough to be worth trying. And what happened on that last scene that you saw there, that chuck up on the skyline that Dave shot, we saw that chuck up there, but we couldn't shoot because of how it was skylined. We weren't sure that the shot was safe. So we drove around to the back side of that hill to see what it was, and it was safe to shoot. We came back, and of course the chuck wasn't there anymore. That's when Dave pulled out the squeaker gave a few barks and sure enough that chuck came right back up and let Dave shoot him. Pretty neat. Give it a try. It'll put a few more chucks in the bag for you. Now this next hunt, this is one we really had a lot of fun making. This, this is one of the most fun hunts we were on in the, this whole video and me and Tim think it's one of the most fun to watch too. It's me and Tim jump shooting jackrabbits in Nevada in December.
Nicely done. Nice shot. Go ahead and take him. Okay, take him. Nice shot. When it's good, it's good. And when it's good, there's nothing better than jump shooting jackrabbits. This is fun, fun, fun. Everybody ought to do it sometime. Got one down on this hill somewhere. Let's see if we can spot him and rock him. Yeah, I see. Call that 250 plus. Oh, yeah, for sure. Three in a row out there now. Nice shot. Wow. Can you guys see this spray? I believe that did. Nicely done. Nicely done, once again. This rabbit hunting's unreal. Nice shot, Jim. The old Winchester does it again. And again and again and again. Three for three this morning. Three shots, three dead bunnies. You know, that's... Four for four, baby. Four for four.
at number 10. Yep. Beauty. One of the nice things about hunting on snow like this is when you do get a wounded rabbit like this one hit his leg it's easy to track him for the follow-up nice shooting See another one sitting up on that hill. Mm -hmm. Nice shot. Another nice shot. About 140 yards. There's another one going across. Nice. Nicely done. A few minutes work with a little Model 7 223. 55 grain V-Max. Good jackrap medicine. Sitting pretty. Wow. That looked like a pillow exploding. Same rabbit looking good. Went right up that trail. Beauty. Another nice shot. Thank you. Tearing them up. Nicely done. Get a few more before it gets too dark.
Nice shot. Well, folks, that's it. End of our first video, Armit Safari. We sure hope you enjoyed it. We sure enjoyed making it. If you're like me and you're looking to get the most accuracy and performance possible out of your rifles, I highly recommend you try a true custom bullet. Starkey Bullets in North Dakota makes some of the best custom bullets I've ever used. Clint Starkey makes them by hand, one at a time. They are a true custom bullet. I recommend you give them a try. I don't think you'll be disappointed. If you're looking for a custom rifle smith, Mike Bryant is one of the best in the business. He's done nearly all my custom work. I've never been anything but absolutely pleased with all of the work he's done for me. His prices and his turnaround times are reasonable. He's extremely easy to work with and talk to. If you need a rifle smith, I seriously suggest you give him a try. For building up your Savage rifle on your own, Sharpshooter Supply in Ohio is the source for parts and the tools you'll need to build your own custom rifle based on a Savage, or they can do the work for you. They've got barrels, triggers, stocks, everything you'd need. I've used most of their accessories and been pleased with all of them. Prices are reasonable. I can't say enough good things about them if you're looking to build up a Savage. We've tried to provide as much information in the short amount of time we had in this video as we could. If you've got more questions or you want to explore varmint hunting topics in more depth, you really ought to get on the internet. There's a lot of great sites out there with a wealth of information available on just about any varmint hunting topic you could think of. Without a doubt, the best all-around site for information on varmint hunting on the whole internet is the Go Go Varmint Go chat board at the Varmint Stand. The Coyote Gods is a site set up especially for predator hunters. They've got a unique perspective with an emphasis on utilization of fur and a heavy concentration of 17 caliber expertise. It's also home to Sean Frame, who in my opinion is the best answer man for technical matters related to firearms on the entire internet. I suggest you give them a look if you're interested in coyote hunting and especially with 17s, saving hides. The Huntmasters BBS is another site geared towards predator hunters. It's got a really unique concentration of predator hunting expertise. I think there's more years of experience crammed into one little spot on the internet there than anywhere else you'll find. You've got some long time successful recreational callers as well as some professional ADC men giving advice there. Well worth a look. Predator Masters is another predator hunting site. It's the largest and the most popular. You'll find a wide variety of topics covered there. Wide variety of opinions. On your screen now is the information for Finley Furs. They put out a video called the Two Minute Coyote. It shows the skinning technique that I use. And if you're interested in making your skinning chores as easy as they can be, I highly recommend you get a hold of them and order their video. It sure saved me a lot of grief. At our website, Rocky Mountain Varmint Hunter, at rmvh.com, we've got links to all of these other websites I've mentioned. I've also got some articles on load tuning, rifle tuning. We'll be putting up some hunting stories. We've got pages with hunting pictures you can look at. Of course, you can always order a video from our website. You can also contact us at rmvh.com. If you got any comments or suggestions, any questions for me or Tim, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for watching.